I told you that you were responsible for health of an entire population? Maybe your city, your province, your country. How would you keep that population healthy? You might think of access to healthcare and medicine or reducing risk of things like smoking. And certainly these things are important. But are these the factors that are going to fundamentally change health in society? I'm an epidemiologist and I study health at the macro or the population level. And sometimes the answers are only apparent when you step back and study individuals thousands and millions at a time. Yet sometimes we also have to find those answers by unpacking individual stories to bring these concepts to life. Today, we're gonna to talk about changing the health trajectory of you and everyone around you. And we're gonna talk about that emerging idea from these two perspectives. From my experience as a population health researcher using a range of analyses and different population health models, and from two very important people in my life who fundamentally embodied what it means to live a long and healthy life. Before we talk about data, let's talk about what we mean by actually improving the health of populations. We can look at one person at a time and focus on improving their health. And if we do this equally for enough people, eventually we will have population health impact. But this is really challenging for a couple of reasons. First, it's really hard to improve everybody's health equally. And that means we leave people behind. And second, and more importantly, this approach ignores the structural and social factors that cut across individuals. And in fact, by working on these factors, we're much more likely to have greater population impact, even if we nudge these factors just a little bit. My research team harnesses the power of population data to produce analyses that help decision makers act in ways to improve health outcomes and to think about how to plan our healthcare system. For example, we study every single death or millions of diabetes cases. We layer on other sources of information on these data and I produce predictive models that tell us what is going to happen in the future in communities, in provinces, and in nations. This type of research certainly can point to our successes when you look at the population level. For example, these are premature mortality rates. These are early deaths, deaths that happen before the age of 75. And they've fallen considerably in the last two decades. But we also see on this graph that those that are most deprived in our society continue to have the highest premature mortality rates. They have not benefited from the health gains in the same way that others in our population have. It means if we're not measuring these societal phenomenon that are happening, we will not have population health benefits. Recently, my research team is taking this data to shift focus on both what feeds into these models and what we measure, and also what comes out on the other side. That is mental, physical, and social well-being, and pointing to the health of our community and the health of the healthcare system itself. We found by linking together survey information with databases on hospitalization and mortality, that those with poor life satisfaction had higher rates of mortality, chronic disease, avoidable hospitalization, higher healthcare costs. The insights from these data are giving us a clue about how we achieve population health. That is one that goes beyond the concept of health behaviors and focuses on life satisfaction. Life satisfaction. When I say those words, I want you to think beyond the first thing that comes to your mind. This is not just about being happy. This is a deep concept that's shaped by your environment around you, your sense of belonging in your society, your relationships with your community and the others. Let's talk about how life satisfaction and the components of life satisfaction improve health. And instead of the millions of people we study to generate these insights, let me tell you about two people, my grandparents, who lived well into their 90s and died without major chronic disease, did not spend much time in hospital, 
and I was fortunate to spend a lot of time with them. And I didn't quite realize it, but they were teaching me about this emerging idea of health, just like my data was. My grandfather rode his bike every day, up and down College Street near his Palmerston home. He did this even into his 90s. An artist who was taking a picture of the neighborhood chose him to photograph because he was a fixture on the street. He did this route every day. And people think, wow, how could someone in his 90s be bike riding every day? You could attribute that to his health behaviors, not smoking, healthy diet. But I know now it was much more than that. There are other factors which caused him to live this long and healthy life that were supported and driven by the community he lived in. My grandfather would then take his bike and ride to the stores up and down Spadina Avenue where he interacted with storekeepers daily. They didn't even speak the same language. My grandfather did not speak English very well at all. But imagine how comfortable you feel in your community that you can go up to someone in an entirely different culture and feel welcome and feel like you belong and even become friends. It's the ultimate sense of belonging and safety. Then his bike took him over to the Toronto Western Hospital, a large academic health center. There he would people watch and share stories with friends and have coffee at the Tim Hortons. He was using the hospital as a place for social interaction, not for treatment at that time. Imagine engaging in the type of activity that ironically kept him out of the hospital for needing care. Then there was my grandmother. She walked to this church on Gray Street every single day. I used to think she was very religious because it didn't matter if it was freezing cold or if there were inches of ice on the sidewalk. She made that trip, even with her cane when she was slowing down. And then one day, I saw her in their community with her friends. She was laughing, they were praying, they were also sharing all stories, the latest news with their families. And I thought, this isn't just an act of devotion. That daily trip was a social connection to her community just around the corner from her downtown home. My grandparents are showing us that the health benefits of belonging and social support in an inclusive community keep them healthy even in the face of adversity. These two individuals had a very tough life. They immigrated to Canada in the 60s, fleeing a desperate economic situation in their home country. My grandfather endured horrific situations on the front lines in World War II. And when they arrived to Canada with their three children, boy and twin girls, they had very little wealth, no concept of health behaviors, and an uncertain future. What enabled that long and healthy life, even in the face of adversity? I believe the answer to this question also relates to what keeps populations thriving and flourishing. So what do we learn from these two perspectives, from the data and from my grandparents differently? about the health and the healthcare system and understand that the choices we make to support positive social relationships in our society are also good for health and health systems. As me and my family mourn the passing of these people, we didn't really think about their individual choices. Instead, we thought about their health not in the absence of disease, but in their strength and vitality and the country and the community that supported them. Let's step back and look around the world. We know the countries that have the highest levels of life satisfaction. And these countries also happen to have the highest population health benefits, like life expectancy. How did these countries create the conditions of life satisfaction for their citizens? We notice many commonalities. Things like freedom, a sense of generosity between citizens, mechanisms in place to strengthen their social relationships, citizens who do not feel left behind, trust in each other and in government, and multi-generational interaction. When I asked you that question at the start about keeping populations healthy, are these not the factors we should be focusing on to change the health of populations? 
When I did my master's, I moved back with my grandparents for a short time, which was convenient for me who did not live in the city because it was an affordable way for me to be close to university. I didn't know it at the time, but they were teaching me about how to achieve population health while I was literally getting an education on how to study population health. I was benefiting so much from the social support I received from them and the many stories they told me. I reflect on that a lot now. And I think about how the opportunities for multi-generational learning are lacking. And unless we support those opportunities, we're missing really important lessons from previous generations. They also benefited from my company and our companionship together. And now there's programs being launched all around the world aimed at pairing younger individuals with older adults who might be living alone. There are several programs such as the McMaster Symbiosis Program that's actively supporting senior and student cohabitation and documenting the positive health benefits for both. So now that we've identified this important idea for creating health, how do we bring this back into population health analytics, into our predictive models? How do I bring this sacred experience I had getting to know my grandparents into the way that we analyze data and to help inform how we make decisions to shape health in society? We talk a lot about the type of methods that we're using, all kinds of interesting technical debates. But we really need to think, be thinking if the data that we're putting into these methods are actually the data that are measuring the factors that matter, the factors that are going to change the health of populations. From someone that's been studying these population data for a long time, I can tell you that the better we integrate these factors into our analytics, into our machine learning algorithms, the better the chance that our data-driven insights will point us into action that improves the health of many and leaves fewer behind. So what does this look like? By integrating this new information, for example, not just counting my grandmother's steps to church every day, but capturing the social network she meets when she gets to the, her destination, we can start to measure and eventually better understand what buttons we need to push to make population level change. The reality is your coastal code is a better predictor of your life expectancy than your genetic code. And that's because it crudely captures some of those social and economic factors that drive health outcomes. Innovation that will harness data on these factors across the life course will shift our thinking on how we define health, how we predict health outcomes, and perhaps what we do about it. With the goal of prevention and equity, health innovation may look a little different. It comes in how we build our cities, our communities, or in the form of policy or legislation that supports or creates the conditions for life satisfaction for all of its citizens. Data has taught me that enhancing broader life satisfaction in the population is not only an admirable goal for society, but one that will translate into improvements in health and a less constrained healthcare system. Likewise, these two individuals in my life have fundamentally embodied this concept in practice. And that is how being active, safe, and socially connected to your community keeps you well, free of disease, and out of hospital. Well, out of hospital for treatment reasons, not necessarily for coffee with friends. Many concepts are emerging in the world right now. Everybody is feeling it. I believe now more than ever we have the opportunity to think better about how we define health, how we imagine our institutions, how we build and strengthen communities and ensure that these ideas are integrated into our health systems, into our algorithms, and into our society. Thank you.